All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Um, you are at the Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Eric Hung, and as one of the co-chairs of the Trainee Research Awards uh, Committee, it's my sort of both honor and pleasure to be able to introduce you uh, to two fantastic speakers um, and to also to introduce you to part one of two of our Trainee Research Awards series. Um, this series has been just a, a real, I think, um, sort of highlight of uh, the fantastic research that trainees um, in our department from across our training programs and across our health systems have been conducting with their mentors over the course of several years. Um, and today it's my pleasure to be able to introduce two of those speakers. So I would like, uh, I'd like to next turn it over to Dr. Matt State, um, who needs no introduction, to be able to introduce one of his mentees, uh, Dr. Helen Wilsey. Good morning, everyone. I am so delighted to be here this morning to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Helen Wilsey. Uh, she's currently a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Dr. Wilsey completed her undergraduate degree uh, in biology at Duke, where she won the Edward C. Horn Memorial Prize for Excellence in Biology. She then went on to do her PhD uh, in genetics at Yale, working with Tian Shu, uh, where she won the Carolyn Slayman Prize, which uh, I quote, recognizes the rem remarkable achievements of our best students in the Department of Genetics based on their body of work and their impact of their findings on the field of genetics. She started a postdoctoral work at Berkeley with Richard Harlan, a true giant in the Xenopus and developmental biology field. And then in 2016, she brought her expertise to my lab, uh, where she launched her research program, which you will hear about today. Uh, well, Dr. Wilsey is officially a postdoc since her arrival at UCSF. She's led the development of this model system to study childhood onset psychiatric disorders. She's defined her own hypotheses and uh, executed on what I think is a truly spectacular program of research. She also is an exceptional mentor in her own right. My role has been to stand back, get out of the way, and have the pleasure of hearing about the exciting progress that she's making using frogs to understand the pathobiology of autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So Dr. Wilsey, please take it away. Thank you, Matt, for that kind introduction, and of course, for your unwavering support and your guidance as my postdoc mentor. I also want to thank the department for this award and also for the opportunity to share my work uh, with you today. Um, and specifically, uh, as Matt said, I'm excited to tell you how we've used frogs to better understand the pathobiology underlying autism spectrum disorders. So let me share my screen with you. Okay, great. Um, so yes, autism biology using frogs. Um, okay, so within the last few years, a revolution has occurred in the identification of lar high competence, large effect autism risk genes. This is largely due to work pioneered by Matt State and others who sequenced the DNA of families in which there was an affected child and unaffected parents, enriching for the identification of rare de novo variants. And now we have a list of 102 reliable autism genes. And importantly, these are thought to be large effect risk genes. Variation in the DNA sequence at just one of these genes is thought to be sufficient to cause a diagnosis. So this really provides an unprecedented opportunity to study what these genes do during brain development and model organisms and to understand the pathobiology underlying autism. Now, if we were to perturb any one gene in a model system, we would likely see several different phenotypes. And on its own, it would be very difficult to say which, if any, of these phenotypes were relevant to the disorder. However, what if instead of studying one risk gene at a time, we studied many in parallel, two, four, six, ten genes, and identified phenotypes in common among many different genes. These sorts of phenotypes, which we call convergent phenotypes, we think are more likely to be relevant to disorder biology. However, this kind of strategy of studying many genes in parallel requires a high throughput model organism. 
So when thinking about which model organism to use to really model a, a disorder that happens in humans, what I'd like to point out is an evolutionary tree of commonly used model organisms. So in this green clade here, these are the vertebrates mice, chicken, frogs, and fish. And here in red are the invertebrates, flies and worms. And importantly, from Xenopus down to worms, these are really considered to be the higher throughput and more cost-effective model organisms where perturbation of multiple genes in parallel uh, are thought to be uh, uh, more feasible. And today I'm gonna to, uh, show you that I selected uh, Xenopus as my model organism of choice. You'll see that of the high throughput common model organisms, it is the closest to humans. And importantly, because I wanna do genetic work, it's important to note that zebra fish actually have a duplicated genome. So that makes identification of the orthologous gene in fish difficult. Whereas the species of frog that I use, Xenopus tropicalis, has a genome that's much more similar to humans. And so it's much uh, more amenable to doing genetic studies. Furthermore, laboratory costs for frogs are about 100 times cheaper than mice. So again, it really allows for the parallel investigation of multiple genes. It's important to note that many of the same developmental processes that happen in the early human embryo also happen during embryonic development for these vertebrate model organisms. All of these organisms undergo gastrulation, neurulation, neural tube closure, and while the details can often vary, the core biological processes are conserved. Further, even at the level of genes and proteins, there is a remarkable degree of conservation between frog and human embryonic development. In fact, much of what we know about human brain development was first described in foundational work in frogs and is now used ubiquitously in human stem cell culture models. One example, it was the discovery of the protein noggin, which is expressed in a small group of cells in the early frog embryo, and in frogs, it was figured out that noggin inhibits a pathway called BMP4, and this is really the first step in inducing the formation of a brain. Similarly, if you take human stem cells and culture and add the protein noggin, again, the BMP4 signaling pathway is inhibited, and these cells end up forming neurons. This is just one example about how foundational knowledge and and Xenopus has informed our understanding of human development, but there are many, many more examples of work like this. Okay, so let's talk more specifically about frogs. Uh, in particular, I study Xenopus tropicalis, an African clawed frog with a diploid genome that's highly similar to humans. Importantly, we can induce them to mate in the lab. This is a, a male and a female mating in the lab, and they'll lay over 4,000 embryos in a single afternoon. Each one of these little dots is a fertilized embryo that this couple has laid. <clears throat> They're amenable to genetic manipulation, both gain and loss of function experiments. They develop externally, and they can be used for drug screening. Because of this external development, you just add the drug into the water. So let's zoom in on one of these embryos. Again, you can see the number of uh, embryos this couple has, has laid. And this little one, we can watch it develop uh, from the very first uh, cell division all the way up until it has, is a free swimming tadpole. Here I'm just showing the, you the first few cell divisions after fertilization. Of course, this is a, a time-lapse movie that we've sped up. Each one of these cell divisions is really more on the scale of an hour. <clears throat> Okay, now the really cool thing about frogs is that we can make half mutant animals. <clears throat> so if we take embryos that are right at this two cell stage, we can physically with a needle inject CRISPR-Cas9 reagents to mutate any gene of interest. We inject these CRISPR reagents with also a red dye so we know which side of the embryo we've manipulated. And what's unique to Xenopus is the fact that these cells don't rearrange during, during early development. And actually, this perturbation will end up forming a half mutant tadpole. So this red half on the right side here will carry a mutation of interest, in our case, an autism risk gene. And we'll be able to compare what happens to brain development on this side of the animal where that gene has been mutated compared to the other half of the animal where the gene has not been manipulated. <clears throat> 
Importantly, this, this process is very quick. We can have free swimming, behaving tadpoles in five days. And it's also very cost effective. It only costs about $25 per gene. So this strategy is amenable to setting many genes in parallel and, and thus is a higher throughput strategy um, than others. <clears throat> As a proof of principle, here's a tadpole where I've mutated a gene involved in eye pigmentation just on the right half of the tadpole. And as you can see, this induces a loss of pigmentation on the injected side compared to its contralateral control. Another nice thing about studying brain development in frogs is that their brain is really beautiful and easy to image. Here we can clearly delineate different anatomical regions just by standard microscopy techniques. We can look at the forebrain, the midbrain, the hindbrain, the olfactory epithelium, and the eye, as well as many other regions. I've also developed a panel of markers to be able to look at many different cell types in vivo as the frog develops. So we have a marker for progenitor cells that are proliferative and they align the ventricles, both excitatory and inhibitory neurons, astrocytes, and microglia. And again, we have the advantage of being able to study all of these cell types at once in vivo. I've also developed imaging methods to be able to image the entire brain in three dimensions. And again, because we can make these half and half mutants, I'm able to actually directly compare both size, cell number, comparing our mutated half of the embryo to our unmanipulated half of the embryo. <clears throat> Okay, so here are our CRISPR controls. Again, this is the, uh, a similar perturbation to what I showed you before, where we've mutated a gene involved in eye pigmentation on only the right side of the embryo. Again, we see an albino eye on the injected side. And importantly, when we image the brains of these animals, the brains are still bilaterally symmetric. And again, this highlights a, a nice feature of frog development because we're able to compare the injected half of the brain to the uninjected half of the brain and make a size ratio where we've really controlled for uh, that frog's development. And you can see in all of our control situations, uninjected, non-targeting guide RNA and in our two pigmentation gene mutants, uh, these cluster are around one, meaning the brain is, is bilaterally symmetric. Now we see a very different story for the autism risk genes. Here I'm showing you two examples of these genes. On the left here, I'm showing you norexin 1, and it's been mutated on the right half of this animal. And when we look at the anatomy of the brain, what you might be able to see is that we see an expansion of this region here, which is the telencephalon, or part of the forebrain region of the brain. Now we have another uh, group of genes that we see the opposite phenotype. So for example, here's the gene SYNGAP1 injected on the right half of the animal. And what you'll see is a reduction in telencephalon or forebrain size on the injected half of the animal. Now I've picked these two genes to show you today on purpose. They're within the top 10 high confidence autism risk genes. And furthermore, they've previously been shown to be very important for neuronal activity. However, what we're seeing here is a much earlier effect on brain size control and specifically cell number within the brain. Here's the quantification of forebrain size for the top 10 autism regimes here all shown in red compared to those four blue controls that I showed you before. So again, this is a size ratio taking the injected side of the animal and normalizing it to the contralateral control. Again, in the controls, they're bilateral really symmetric. But now when we start to look at the top 10 autism risk genes, which span a wide range of biological and cellular functions, we can see that in some cases, the brain size increases, but for other genes, the brain size decreases. And again, this really highlights uh, the, the advantage in frogs of being able to have the contralateral control because we're able to pick up subtle differences in brain size that might otherwise be missed when you're comparing between different different animals. Uh, so you may be wondering if there's any evidence for these kinds of anatomical changes in the patient population. And indeed, for some of these genes where patient cohorts are large enough and have been well characterized, there is evidence for macrocephaly in some cases, like for example, CHD8, and uh, microcephaly in other ones like DERK1A and POGZ. And even looking at the Decipher database, there are hints that uh, this could be going on in the patient population. Um, so we're encouraged by this for our frog work. 
Uh, next, I wanted to do a drug screen to try to uh, identify compounds that could modify this effect. Um, because we saw brain size changes and really a, a change in cell number and cell divisions, we thought perhaps, we wanted to use an oncology drug set because oncology genes oftentimes interact uh, with cell division. <clears throat> One of the top 10 autism genes, DIRK1A, is a kinase, and there are well-characterized kinase inhibitors that can target it. So we used this inhibitor to produce the phenotype we saw with multiple autism genes, and then screened this FDA-approved drug library to identify any genes that could modify the effect of this kinase inhibitor. This took over 2,000 embryos, 17 plates of drugs, 124 antibody stainings, and five days of imaging. Actually, it wasn't that bad. And we developed various tools uh, using a 3D printer to make this a bit more high throughput. For example, these uh, trays here made the antibody stainings much better, and so we, we just 3D printed those. And we also 3D printed a bunch of stamps to be able to help us uh, position the embryos to be able to image their brains at much uh, faster speed, making this a little bit more high throughput, and we've made all that available uh, to the community. So if anybody's interested, just email me. I'll send you the 3D printer files. Okay, so what did we find from our drug screen? So let me orient you. Here is the control DMSO situation, uh, and when we add the DIRK1A kinase inhibitor, you can see a major change from the control. And importantly, then what we did was add each one of these genes on top of the DIRK1A inhibitor and specifically looked for compounds that, uh, in combination with the inhibitor, either made the phenotype better, closer to the control, or made it worse by greater than a standard deviation. We called those enhancers. I'll cut to the chase. What's really exciting is that we hit the estrogen pathway four times. So estromucine here uh, activates the estrogen signaling pathway. That made the phenotype better, closer to control. And these three compounds here inhibit estrogen signaling. And in these cases, they seem to make the phenotype a bit worse. Uh, we are really excited and intrigued by this for two main reasons. First is there is a profound sex bias in autism. Uh, almost four times as many males as females are diagnosed with this disorder. And there's long been proposed a female protective effect in autism. Second, work by, by Matt's lab in collaboration with Antonio Geraldes at Yale also identified estrogen as a suppressor of a behavioral phenotype in a fish mutant for an autism risk gene. So again, from a, from a drug screen, estrogen was picked out as being able to modify a behavioral phenotype. And, and on our case, using a drug screen again, estrogen was again identified with a totally different library as modifying an anatomical phenotype uh, among many autism machines. So that led us to question, what is the role of estrogen during brain development? Uh, this is a uh, a simple experiment where I've mutated aromatase, the enzyme that's required for estrogen synthesis, on one half of the animal. What's very interesting is, again, similar to some of the autism genes, we see a reduction in forebrain size, among other phenotypes, on the injected half compared to the uninjected half. Uh, this is especially interesting because it suggests perhaps autonomous or local signaling of estrogen within the brain uh, because we do not see a global change despite uh, reducing estrogen signaling on that half of the animal. So to summarize, what I've shown you today is simple experiments in frogs have led, have led us to gain insights into autism pathobiology. I wanna emphasize the strategy we've taken of identifying phenotypic convergence. Rather than studying just one gene at a time, we've instead studied 10 genes in parallel and identified a phenotype in common to those uh, genetic manipulations. Notably, and for all 10 top autism risk genes, we saw changes in brain size, brain growth, and implicated the process of neurogenesis uh, in the function of these genes. Ooh. Further, I identified through a drug screen that the estrogen signaling pathway can potentially modify these phenotypes. And I also showed you evidence that estrogen signaling endogenously within the animal is important for brain development on its own.
and converges with the same phenotype that we saw with the autism risk genes. Uh, so in the future, I'm really excited to be thinking about what estrogen is doing during brain development and how that intersects with other psychiatric disorders. Autism is not the only sex bias psychiatric disorder. There are many. And so now we're trying to probe these interactions between the typical function of estrogen during brain development and what may go uh, awry uh, following mutation of risk disorder genes. Uh, we're also very interested in studying uh, the autism risk genes in, in the context of cell division and cell cycle. Some data I didn't show you, but you could probably infer from the fact that we saw changes in cell number, is that we're very interested in how these risk genes affect the cell cycle. And excitingly, we just discovered that one of these high confidence autism risk genes, DERK 1A, actually localizes to the mitotic spindle during cell division. So we're really excited to be thinking about what that has an impact on brain development. And also, uh, you know, I showed you how this strategy uh, has been working for understanding autism pathobiology, but now we have high confidence, large effect risk genes for other disorders, including Tourette disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. So I'm looking forward to applying the same strategy to these disorders to, again, try to identify uh, points of phenotypic convergence within the disorder risk genes. So with that, that, I would like to thank first and foremost my mentor Matt State. Uh, he has been such a, a shining light of guidance and support for my postdoctoral work. He's given me unprecedented opportunities to, to just go with my ideas and see what these genes are doing in the developing embryo. I want to thank my lab mates and fellow froggers, Cameron, Yushao, and Jean, who made important contributions to these experiments. I also want to thank Gigi, Sonia, Cliff, and Juan in the lab for their help. I want to thank our collaborators, both at UCSF and AFAR. I want to thank our Xenopus-specific resources and our, our sources of funding. And last but not least, I want to thank the frogs. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I, I welcome any questions you might have. All Eric, right. if you're Helen, talking, you're muted. Helen, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. So as you're unsharing your screen, so that way we can um, sort of see your face and ask some questions. Uh, we've got a number of specific questions uh, uh, for you. I I'd like to take kind of the moderator's uh, sort of privilege just to ask a, a sort of a, a basic question for someone who's not as familiar with frogs. And, and just thinking about the sort of the, the frog as your animal system, um, you kind of articulated some of the advantages, uh, but if you could just um, sort of highlight for uh, some of us non-froggers um, the relative disadvantage of selecting the system in, in, in your approach. Sure. Uh, you know, I never like to highlight my disadvantages, but I will give you a more balanced uh, side of the story, which is, you know, there are some cell types that are specific to human in brain development that simply don't exist in frogs. Uh, they also don't exist in mice. Uh, so we still have those problems in terms of understanding what those cell types do and how these genes may be functioning in them. Uh, one of those cell types are, are outer radial glia, and you know it's really thought to be important for brain growth. Um, so we don't have those cells. Uh, we will miss phenotypes uh, that are uh, specific to those cells. Um, but, uh, and, and other, other human-specific features of brain development are simply not going to be captured by studying uh, these genes in frogs. Uh, however, these genes are so highly conserved that if they're doing something in outer radial glia, they're probably doing it in the apical radial glia, which the frogs do have, and so you can start to get hints. But of course, um, experiments in frogs are one of the first steps and really just, uh, we think of this as a way to build testable hypotheses to then go to those more targeted uh, and, and less high throughput systems to really start to get uh, what we've missed in frogs and fill in the blanks there. Absolutely, thanks. Cool. Thank you. All right, so on to some specific questions. Uh, so do you have uh, other evidence um, of the specific biology that you have found is likely to be relevant in humans apart from seeing just macro and microencephaly? Mm. 
Uh, there, yes, it's a great question. Uh, I did not talk about it at all. It depends on the gene. So, for example, one of the genes we focused on, DERK1A, uh, in, the, in the human haploinsufficiency case, often or almost always has uh, other uh, issues with kidney development or urogenital tract development. Um, and we see those same issues uh, in the frog. They have cystic kidneys. Uh, we've also, you know, gone into the molecular mechanism of how that works and, and identified a cilia phenotype uh, in, in those animals, uh, which could explain uh, some of the kidney issues. And also, you know, based on that work, we, we hypothesize that they may also have heart defects. And when we go and look in these databases of, of patient clinical work, we can actually find patients that have DERK1A haploinsufficiency and then also have congenital heart disease. So. Uh, I think uh, uh, one other interesting thing we've seen of, among these genes, but but varies by gene, is whether they're they have other disorders and other uh, tissues such as um, kidney, heart. Uh, within the brain, by and large, the most striking phenotype has been uh, macromicrocephaly. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, so next question is a, a timing development question. Um, so does your data give any sense um, of when these things might be happening? Uh, and does the frog correlate with what we know about human brain development? Great question. It's something we've thought about a lot. So we actually did time course RNA sequencing of the developing tadpole brain throughout these stages that I showed you. Um, and when we take that the transcription data and overlay it on top of transcription profiling from the developing human brain, and we look at when these genes come on in the frog brain, uh, the time at which they come on in frog maps to mid-gestation in, in the human developing brain. And then the, the time at which we see these uh, large anatomical changes in the frog is uh, maps to right around birth in the human brain. So it's definitely something we're thinking about. Um, similar to in the, in the human work that's been done, looking at when and, when and where these genes are expressed, that's highlighted mid-gestation. Um, and we're seeing the same kinds of things in the frog, highlighting you know, a point of neurogenesis during uh, mid-gestation. Great, thank you. Um, next question is about cells. Um, so do you have a sense of what kinds of cells are affected uh, in the semi-mutant frogs with the asymmetric brain growth? Yeah, I did have time to show you this data, uh, but it, it looks really cool. So we've been looking at apical radial glia that line the ventricles. We have some nice tools to be able to image them. Um, and, and we do see primarily those are the cells that uh, where we, you know, we can see in the larger brains there are more of these proliferative progenitors and in the smaller brains there are less. Um, so we think that that might be an important cell type for this. When we look at where these genes are expressed, they're there at the right time in those cells or in their immediate progeny. Uh, so we think that's an important cell type. Uh, it's hard to disentangle the proliferation of those cells with defects in their ability to differentiate, uh, but that's something we're actively, actively looking at. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna sort of zoom out um, a question from um, one of our faculty members is to, you know, to help us kind of think big picture, uh, which is, you know, how do you um, imagine or fantasize sort of translating your findings into sort of ultimately helping patients down the road? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a fantastic question. Obviously, the motivation of this work is ultimately to help patients. Um, I think, you know, we've seen with the identification of these large effect risk genes and really the understanding that autism is primarily a genetic disorder, that even that information alone helps with stigma. It helps people understand what has happened here and gives them some insight uh, and, and some peace of mind and, and an understanding. So I think in that case, foundational discovery work, I think also contributes to that reduction in stigma and a broad understanding. Now, moving forward to something like patient treatment or something like that, that, that obviously will take a lot more work and, and models beyond frogs, of course. Uh, we have lots of great collaborations with labs that use uh, human stem cells uh, and culture. Uh, and so where we, you know, one of the motivations for doing a drug screen was that any compounds we found, we could just carry that across the hall to a lab that was that had human stem cells and then they could put that drug on, on those neurons as well to start to understand you know what those do during 
uh, brain development. Um, so it's, it is early days. Again, we're doing mostly foundational knowledge. Uh, but again, I, I think identifying compounds that can modify and really understand what they're doing at the molecular level and then moving into more human relevant models. Uh, for me, that's the strategy that I think uh, will move us closer to impacting the lives of patients. Great. And maybe one last question and to kind of just perhaps uh, 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 kind of expand on what you just uh, sort of left, last left with. So um, do you then see any um, of the biological changes um, in, uh, in frog and other model systems, including human cells? Uh, sure. So we've modeled some of, uh, uh, of what we've seen in frogs and human uh, neural progenitor cells. Uh, so uh, uh, in collaboration with Jeremy Wilsey's lab, they've made uh, uh, knockdowns, for example, for the, for the gene DERK1A. Uh, and this is work from Nawe in Jeremy's lab. And so he, she can uh, inhibit this gene and, and she sees a, an increase in the number of proliferative progenitors very similar to what we see in the frogs. And then when she adds estrogen, that can rescue that phenotype as well. So there's one example where we really are moving straight into human cells um, in a more targeted way. So again, using the frogs to, to generate hypotheses and moving into human cells to validate and extend the work. Well, thank you so much. We are at 9.30. Um, for um, those that would like to um, send a reaction, please send Dr. Wilsey a huge round of applause. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. And thank you both to Dr. Wilsey and to Dr. Bobrow for just kicking us off for our trainee research grand round series. We will be back on with part two of this series next month. And for everyone, thank you for participating in grand rounds um, and have a good rest of your morning. <laughs>